10 second security tip, go. Vulnerability scanning does not equal vulnerability management. Don't lose sight of the end goal. You need to know why you're doing something in order to create an effective outcome and guide your teams towards reducing risk. It's time to begin the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. Welcome to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. I'm David Spark. I'm the producer of this darn show and the producer of the CISO series. My co-host is here with me, Mike Johnson. Mike, prove to everyone that you actually exist. You sound surprised. My co-host is here with me. I'm I'm here, David. I'm here with everyone with our lovely audience. This is really me. It is you. You look it just like yourself. Just like me. We are available at CISOseries.com or on the subreddit of CISO Series. This week, by the way, this is going to be airing in, in April, but this week that we're doing this, we're doing actually a, an AMA on uh, on the subreddit cybersecurity, which is a lot of fun. It's crazy, crazy active as well. It's been, it's been great. It's been pretty darn awesome. But everyone can go to our subreddit, which is the CISO Series subreddit as well. And by the way, every Friday we do these really fun cybersecurity video chats, the CISO series video chats, and they're a ton of fun and they're really engaging. And if you've gone to a lot of webinars and you think they stink, I agree with you. They often do. (laughs) But our video chats are a ton of fun. I just want to mention that. Now, our sponsor today is Nucleus Security. You actually heard our guest from Nucleus Security at the beginning of the show. I'm going to introduce him in a second. They do vulnerability management, which We've talked a lot about on this show, and we're going to talk about it again on this show, some very interesting angles with regards to risk management and vulnerability management as well. Now, Mike, I have got a question for you, and I want you to answer completely honestly. Okay, honestly. Do you think I, David Sparks, (laughs) would make a good CISO? No. No. (laughs) <laughs> there you go. There's your honest answer. <laughs> because I couldn't believe it. One of our listeners, I believe it was, I believe it was Jason Dance. I, you know, I hope I don't screw this up. But he said, "Have you ever thought about being a CISO? Why don't you be a CISO?" And I, I, I was flabbergasted because, <laughs> for those people who don't know, I have, I am not a cybersecurity practitioner. All my knowledge is 100% secondhand. It is me absorbing from other incredibly smart people like yourself and our guest. But he thought I, I have fooled him and the rest of the audience, maybe, or maybe <laughs> some members of the audience, that I could pull off CISO. What do you think? Is there any way I could do it? In no I, way. No, I, I think what it, what it really comes down to is there's multiple parts to being a CISO. One of them is that interpersonal relationships, to be able to have those conversations with broad swaths of a company, the business side, the technical side. And absolutely, David, you can do that. You have a gift for those conversations. By the way, I did not ask this question just for compliments. <laughs> I want everyone to know this. I did not. I was just more shocked that somebody thought I could but. do this. Oh, here comes the but. This is definitely not going to be a compliment sandwich. <laughs> this is going to be an open-faced <laughs> insult yes. sandwich. Yes. <laughs> the, the flip side is you have to develop a certain amount of experience in the security field to... Which I have none. To have the inherent trust of other folks around you. They have to trust that you that you know what you're doing. And that's something that really comes from been there, done that, and been in the trenches. And you know, that, that's something that can come with time, David, if if you do want to have a career change. But I don't. I'm actually very happy with what I'm doing right now. Yeah, and and keep it, on doing that. Yes. I'm very happy with that. <laughs> but I was just shocked that someone thought I could be a CISO because I don't think I could be a CISO at all. <laughs> All right. Enough of that. Thank you for the compliments, by the way, Mike. I greatly appreciate it. But then it it landed with the, ah, you can't pull it off, David. So we, we're both in agreement here. Yes. <laughs> All right. I want to bring in our sponsor guest. I'm very, very happy that he's here with me. And by the way, this topic of vulnerability management, we speak about again. I love talking about this. It's a great topic as well. It's Scott Kufer, who is the co-founder and COO of Nucleus Security. Scott, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, well, thanks so much for having me, David and Mike. Big time fan. Happy to finally peek behind the curtains. There's got to be a better way to handle this. I constantly hear security leaders talk about people, process, and technology. Overwhelmingly, most security vendors are selling technology. Then after a very steep drop, there is a sale of managing people. 
And then process feels kind of like a neglected stepchild. What is the one process change you've made, Mike, I'm going to you first, in the past year that has had a significant impact on your security posture? And what is the process in security that needs the most help? What do you say? We were part of a larger change. So I don't take sole credit that this was just a security initiative, but we had significant security benefit from it. And we significantly changed the way that we purchase products and services within the company. We consolidated down multiple independent processes and brought them all together. We brought together vendor reviews across IT, data privacy, legal, and security all in one place. And the impact of that has been, it's easier for people to go through these processes, which meant that our finance team was on board with making this a gate. For a purchase to be made in the company, finance won't go forward with it unless that purchase request has gone through this process. So now we have all of our purchases going through this single streamlined process where security does get those security reviews, where we have a chance to see what the purchases are to provide our perspectives on them to say, this is risky, this is not risky. And that really has had that good, that good benefit where we have that improved level of security within our vendor, within our supply chain, if you want to call it that way. All right, let me hold you before you answer the second part. I want to go to Scott on this one. So Scott, what has been a significant process change you have made that has had the biggest impact? Well, funny enough, the example that I wanted to bring up is kind of the opposite or the inverse of what Mike just brought up. So we have, you know, as a vendor, we go through due diligence processes all the time. And so because of that, we're required to essentially do the exact opposite, but the same with our process. And so we recently also made a significant change to our overall business process to bring IT, privacy, legal, and security together, but from our side so that we could more effectively review all of the questions that we're getting from all of our external clients that we're working with and our vendors. And it actually helped us to identify potential gaps that we didn't necessarily know about because we've now consolidated everything through a single process and a single point of failure. And we've got teams actually working together. So like we have actually attorneys working with our IT teams, which is kind of crazy, but it's just kind of funny. It's the exact same thing, just in a, in a different context. All right. Now for both of you, and I'll go back to you, Mike, now, what do you think? And maybe, maybe let's speak to the overall security industry, like what you see, maybe not specifically yourselves, but what processes do you think need the most improvement? And there, would there be an opportunity for a security vendor to help with that? Because I see like the majority of process issues when we talk about them, they're more around project management and increased automation. So I'm, I'm going to beat my asset management drum yet again. Yes. Okay. You cannot be surprised when you hear me talk about asset management. I really do think that is the biggest process in security that needs help. I do think there's a place for vendors here, both from making it easier to discover the assets that a vendor is providing, but also as tooling to help discover and manage those assets. I think associated with that, though, there is the need for improved processes like policies around if your asset isn't in the asset database, then it doesn't get connected to the network. You need that part of it as well. And that then brings in project management to say, all right, well, we're bringing this new thing online. One of the steps that's required for us is to go through and ensure that we're in the asset management system. All right. Quick answer from you, Scott. What do you think is a big opportunity in process for the security industry? I mean, I hate to agree with Mike. Asset management is definitely a huge, a huge one. But honestly, I think that just the overall kind of workflow management piece at a higher level really needs a lot of help in just security in general. Because if you look at the kind of old school business process tools, they're not really built for security or security processes. And I think there's a huge opportunity for security vendors to build tooling around really business productivity tools in the security space with that security expertise that's required because that just really is a huge problem for businesses in general and there's there's nothing really out there to help with that at this point 
do you think of this vendor marketing tactic? Are security vendors eating their own dog food? The next time a security vendor pitches you, Chris Roberts of Hillbilly Hit Squad said on LinkedIn, quote, ask them if they are using their own systems to protect themselves or they're relying on someone else's technology to protect their arses. Now, it's an excellent question, and how a vendor answers that question is very telling. So I'm putting you on the spot, Scott. I'm asking you, do you use your own product to protect your business? First off, yes, but but before I answer as to how and why, bringing that up makes me kind of sad and, and miss conferences with this whole COVID thing going on because I actually met Chris a few years ago at RSA, and I've always enjoyed what he's had to say since then. I think that it tends to be really insightful for vendors like like us, where they're trying to make us look in the mirror to make sure that we're actually doing what we're selling. And so first off, Chris, keep fighting the good fight. But to answer your question specifically, yes, we definitely use Nucleus internally. I mean, just kind of from the get-go, we built Nucleus to solve the challenges that we were experiencing ourselves as vulnerability analysts and vulnerability managers. And so I don't think I could look at myself in the mirror in the morning if we didn't use it internally. And so... And we have it in integrated with our environment in such a way that we're doing continuous monitoring. We're obviously hooking it up to all of our business processes and all of that fun stuff. But I mean, originally, we weren't even going to sell Nucleus. We were actually just built it internally. But we decided to do so after we were using it ourselves for a while. And uh, we realized just how much it's a problem for everyone else and, and not just us. So it's one of those things that we definitely, definitely require just as a vendor. We, we definitely need to use it ourselves. By the way, that story, like we built it for ourselves and then realized other people needed it, extremely common founder's story, which I love that story, by the way, because heck, I mean, that that makes complete sense. Mike, I mean, you've worked for a bunch of companies that have a product that you could actually use for your own use. What say you? Did you actually use your own product? So the first company that I really worked for where we leveraged our own product with Salesforce. And we used to call it drinking our own champagne rather than eating your own dog food. Rather than eating your own dog food sounds a lot better. <laughs> but I, I really can't imagine a vendor not using their own products. Like Scott was saying, they built Nucleus for a reason, to solve a problem that they had. And if your product itself doesn't solve a security problem that you have, what's your market opportunity? I can't imagine a vendor not using it. It's an interesting question, especially if the response is no, we don't use it. I don't like hang up the phone at that point. No, but I think the way Scott answered, he answered the perfect founder story. Like we built it for ourselves because sure. we saw a problem and then we realized, oh, wait a second, other people have this problem. Let's sell the darn thing. Yeah. And and one of the other benefits of it is there's that opportunity to be customer zero or customer one, depending on, on where you index and where you start your counting. That gives valuable feedback to your product teams where you've got a real life usage of the product that you're going to provide unfiltered feedback. You know, it, it's not just feedback, but it's utterly unfiltered. And, and you can kind of go around the corner and curse at someone and say, hey, you know, this thing isn't working the way that it should fix it. And it's feedback that you're not going to get from customers. And it also gives you the opportunity to maybe avoid some embarrassment to fix something before a customer sees it. All right. I have to go back to Scott. Was there cursing? Scott? I can neither confirm nor deny <laughs> the inner workings of the Nucleus product team, especially in the early days. There may or may not have been alcohol involved but as well. being essentially customer number one, just give me an idea of like one huge thing that you had to overcome before you even released it to the first beta customer. Yeah, so I was actually the first user of, of Nucleus way back in the day. And I knew immediately that we had built this thing that was required manual work for stuff. And we had decided that we wanted to build a product to help solve workflow problems, but we had replaced one workflow with just a different workflow. And so I basically started using it way back, you know, 2016, and just went, this is just not helping, right? It's just replacing one thing with another. And so that was the very first challenge that we had to overcome before we had any beta customers at all. It's time to play What's Worse. Scott has made it very clear he's a fan of the show, but he is afraid of this segment, and he should be, <laughs> because this one's tough. 
But the good news is, is that I always toss to Mike first, so he has to deal with him. Then you could just go off of agreeing or disagreeing with him. And you know I always like people when they disagree. I'll do my best. Yes, please do. All right, Mike, here we go. This comes from Jeremy Kempner of BT Americas, his first What's Worse he submitted to us. And here we go. Would you rather have all employees on free personal email accounts like Yahoo or Gmail for the business, or would you rather have all inter-office communications and attachments through a free chat tool like Facebook Messenger or Gchat? <laughs> It's a good one. I like this one. Oh, gosh. Uh, I'm surprised Carrier Pigeon wasn't an option. Because that would have, that would have been preferable. That, that would have been the easy one. Actually, it would be. It's not easy to copy Carrier Pigeon. Right. I guess where I kind of have to fall back on this would be the security of the platforms that we're talking about. Recognizing that the email platforms are especially if we're talking Yahoo or Google, they've been around for a while and they really have decent levels of security built in uh, at this point. The free chat platforms, not so much. But are, are, do they have the same kind of encryption that like I know Facebook Messenger has deployed? It depends on if the message is leaving the platform or not. So if, if the email is staying within Yahoo, then in motion, it's still encrypted, much like what you would see for Facebook Messenger. It's that same level of network-based encryption. But the actual getting into the system and potentially impersonating somebody else, potentially passwords and whatnot. Cut to the chase, Mike. Which one you're picking? I, I, I would just have to lean slightly towards the email platform. As being better or worse? As being better. Uh, so the the worst one in this scenario would be the would be the chat platforms. I have a good argument against it. Wondering if Scott's going to go with me on this. Which one do you choose, Scott? Oh man! So the funny part about this is that we actually talked to a, a vendor not too long ago that actually would, fell into one of these camps where they had all of their internal communications via the free uh, email route. And I have to say. This is a very, very difficult one. I, I could definitely go either way on it. I think, you know, obviously it's going to depend. You know, we can't accept that answer. It depends. No, no it's going to depend on which chat platform it would be kind of situation. But oh, that's that's the easy way out. Like if you're saying, hey, it's if you use Signal, then then all all good. Up. No, no. It's one of the ones I offered up. So if it's like Facebook Messenger, I am going to I'm going to lean towards the chat platform being slightly better. Slightly better. Okay, slightly good. better. So I'm going to say that's the worst one is the email. Okay, and what's your rationale? So you're disagreeing with Mike. What's your rationale? I'm going to disagree with Mike. I'm trying, but <laughs> my reasoning is that at least with Facebook Messenger, you have some level of verification of who people are. And so with a regular email, kind of free email account, you can sign up as whoever you want. And there's no real control around that. Whereas at least with like some sort of chat platform like that, there tends to be some level of, you can't just go change your name on you. So you can at least look at them and figure out who they are. So I'm, I'm gonna go with the kind of identity route or the identity argument. A very good answer. I'm gonna add to you to that, by the way, just so you know, Mike, Scott wins on this one. No, no you're both wrong. The, no, no. Uh, <laughs> the other reason is email is the more popular attack vector. That's why you want to put all your communications on the chat platform. Oh, yeah. There's definitely no phishing via chat. No, there is. No, <laughs> yeah. I'm just talking about popular in terms. Yes, there is phishing, but I'm talking about what's more popular. It would be the email. I'll take the win. I'll take the W. <laughs> <laughs> w in Scott's column. Let's go. Please, enough. No, more. Today's topic is risk-based vulnerability management, which I'll simply define as prioritizing your vulnerability management based on the risk it poses to your organization. Mike, I'll begin with you. What have you heard enough about with risk-based VM, and what would you like to hear a lot more? What I've heard enough of is, like, we don't care about risk. We'll just use CVSS scores straight up. Whatever that score is, we'll just prioritize based on that. That's still a lot of the typical way people 
prioritize their vulnerabilities. So heard enough of just straight CVSS, risk doesn't matter. What I'd like to hear more of is how do you use asset information combined with real world attack information? So it's real data about your network and then real data about the types of attacks that are out there and leverage that to prioritize the application of fixes. That's what I'd like to hear more of. Good point. Now I throw this to you, Scott, who works in the world of vulnerability management. What have you heard enough about with regard to, again, risk-based VM, and what would you like to hear a lot more? Well, quite honestly, I've heard enough about risk-based vulnerability management in general, (laughs) just as a topic. I hate hearing this phrase in general because it tends to be used, number one, incorrectly by all of the vendors. And it also doesn't really equate to prioritization in the sense of what we're really talking about. Let me pause you there for a second. How are they saying it incorrectly? And what would you say? Is prioritization vulnerability management the word we should be using or what? I mean, explain. So, well, risk-based vulnerability management just in general is being used to kind of conflate to prioritization in in general, whereas risk-based vulnerability management is really just a different approach to how you're actually trying to manage your overall risk using vulnerability data to do so. And I know that sounds kind of, maybe there's a bit of a nuance there, but it just goes beyond what's what we're trying to fix first. It is, it's really more about using asset context and tools to prioritize at scale, more so than just trying to find a different way to prioritize because we don't want to build a better CVSS score. What we want to do is to take CVSS, improve upon it, take what it does well, and then tie that to other tools that do other things well. Like as Mike mentioned, the threat prioritization is great. Tying it to asset context and tying it back to asset inventory is another great thing, but there's a lot of challenges associated with it. And I'd love to hear more about how every organization is different. And so we need to use tools that are flexible enough to actually capture the differences being used rather than just relying on things like CVSS or even just threat intel tied to CVE numbers. All right. This is, I'm going to give you an opportunity to talk specifically about what Nucleus Security is doing here. How then is Nucleus Security creating this context around vulnerability management? Sure. So what Nucleus does is aggregates all of the vulnerability and asset data in your organization into a correlated and consolidated, essentially vulnerability and asset data warehouse. And what we're doing is we're taking all of the vulnerability data and we're overlaying the real world context, such as the threat intelligence and what real world actors are doing. We're also tying asset context on top of the vulnerability data to give you a real picture of all of the actual threats that are being posed to your to your assets within your organization. And then you have the flexibility to actually go in and essentially use your asset context to prioritize what you would like to fix and then orchestrate some sort of response off of that. So it's really more of a workflow management tool in the sense where prioritization is one piece of the workflow, but it is not the entire workflow. I'm going to throw this to you, Mike, for a second. What is the context in vulnerability management you would like to see more of? What I would like to see more of from a context perspective is recognition of what my assets are, the data that's associated with them. To use the overloaded term, that helps me understand the risk of that system. And bringing that context together, combining it with the vulnerabilities, that's what leads me to, hey, I need to prioritize this system over this system. So that's the context that I would like to see is paying attention to the data that that system carries. And that helps me prioritize prioritize the fixes and and what I'm going to get to first. How have you seen this context-aware behavior playing itself out, Scott? So this is highly dependent on organizations and what kind of data they're trying to manage. So obviously DevSecOps, and I know you hate that term, Mike, but like application security shops will do this completely differently and they need to manage their risk from application vulnerabilities separately from say the network security teams. And so application security teams, what they'll do is they'll build essentially vulnerability scanning into their CI CD pipeline and then they'll integrate source code repositories and source code repository information and they'll tie that to some sort of asset inventory system that has the register of what type of data or how important is this application to our environment. And then they can prioritize and contextualize around the different layers of the tech stack rather than just looking at either your, say, your SCA results or your source code repository or your dependabot results or things like that. So that's generally what we see is kind of a more holistic approach to managing your vulnerability data at scale across the whole tech stack rather than just looking at these individual silos. How have you actually pulled this off? 
One of the key parts of a successful pen test is the reconnaissance phase, where you're generating the necessary background information. Walk us through that process. How much are you planning versus discovering? And I'm assuming a lot of creativity goes into making a successful pen test. What are some of the techniques and information you need that increases your success? Now, Scott, I know you've been a pen tester. I understand, Mike, you have not. I thought you had done pen testing. No, but we'll start with you, Scott, on this one. Explain the sort of that that beginning process of discovery before you do an actual pen test. Sure. So honestly, if I didn't end up in vulnerability management, I would definitely have enjoyed being a pen tester as kind of my secondary career choice. Honestly, in my opinion, the recon is the most fun part. So the first step is really the part that really kind of gets gets my juices flowing from a, from a pen tester perspective. And kind of at the lower levels, you've got some users that are just looking at things like Maltigo to try to discover and essentially do asset discovery and sort of asset inventory of an external system. But if I'm being honest, I think that gathering emails and scraping emails to do phishing assessments and kind of trying to get in, go in through the email is probably the thing that I was probably the best at and the most fun. And just a shameless brag here, but I did actually get an 84% click rate on an email campaign once. And they still talk about it. What was what was the topic that you got that success rate? So what I decided to do was to spoof basically a, a USA Today article talking about, and I, I created a fake USA Today article talking about how this particular company had overtaken the number one competitor in this space. And then I attached that to the email basically as a forward. So I made it look like it was a forward coming from the CEO that said, great job, everybody. We just became number one. You know, click here to see if we're going to do, we're going to do a bonus based on this. And then we got an 84% click rate. So I'm very proud of that. But uh, <laughs> as far as the actual process goes, the first part is really just discovering what you have to work with because that's where the creativity and planning comes in. So when you, when you start to identify what the landscape looks like is, okay, well, what users do they have? What technologies are they, are they using? And are they in multiple clouds? Is it a hybrid cloud on-prem situation? I mean, honestly, the hardest part is getting in in the first place, because once you're in, you can pretty much pivot to wherever you want. Then then it's just about getting uh, not getting discovered. So it's that that initial planning and recon that really allows you to to be creative and in, in actually breaching people. You have not done this yet, Mike. You're missing <laughs> out. Of the, the, you're very creative in cybersecurity. You could essentially be pen testing, fooling people. <laughs> well, I I think I look at security quite often, and th- this is an overgeneralization of personalities of attackers or defenders. And you can loosely group people in security into one of those two. And I've just always been a defender. And that has led me to not be a pen tester. I actually think I'd be terrible at it. But when I think about reconnaissance, for some companies, for some organizations, their attackers are better at asset inventory than the company is. They understand that perimeter. They understand the infrastructure, all of the vendors that are in use, all of the cloud apps, all of the operating systems, all of the people. You can go and find all of that. And that's quite often the reconnaissance phase of an attack, be it an unauthorized attack or an authorized attack uh, in the case of a pen tester. And really, that's kind of the first step, just essentially to asset management from the outside. And now you've got a map almost where you can look at and say, well, I know that there's vulnerabilities over here, or here's who can give grant access to these particular systems. All of that is laid out there. So it's there, there you kind of have to then focus back to the rules of engagement. What are you testing, making sure that you're scoping your penetration test to what's agreed upon? If you kind of go off script, that becomes a problem. Uh, If you're testing things that was not designed or requested to be tested, that can become a problem. So you have to go back to those rules of engagement. And then you can take that information that you've found from the discovery, create that path, and find your initial entry point. Where do you get in? And then it's you're pivoting from there, moving from system to system to get closer to your target potentially exfiltrating data from there. That's kind of, that's my world, my simplified world of penetration testing and might also be why I'm not a penetration tester. 
Such a simplified view. I'm sure pen <laughs> testers are listening to the to this and going, oh. They're all angry at me right now. <laughs> He's such a simpleton when it comes to pen <laughs> testing. <laughs> Just a simpleton in general. Yeah. Well, that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you very much, Mike, for your attempt at pen testing. Uh, <laughs> Scott, I'm impressed with the creativity of the USA Today story. That is a good one. We have quoted, by the way, your own Levy tells a story of a, a really successful pen test that they had done, which he had quoted somebody else at his organization. But they got a very high open rate, and it was just an email about a lost puppy in the parking lot. And that drove a lot of clicks on that, too. It's, it's usually just hitting that nerve that people have of either compassion or self-interest that works. And so just knowing that that's what a, you know, a crook would want to do to you, you got to be aware of these things. You know, the classic case, if it's too good to be true, probably is. All right. I want to thank our sponsor, Nucleus Security and our guest, which, by the way, I'll let you have the last word here. This was great, by the way, Scott. Thank you so much. This uh, I learned a lot. I set you up on this discussion about vulnerability management and the, the risk basis, thinking of it as prioritization, but you have corrected me in my vision of that. So thank you very much. Mike, any last words from you? Scott, thank you very much for joining us. The overall theme that I got from you and I really appreciate it was keep coming back to workflows and processes and, and how important those are. And that was really woven into every part of your discussion. Uh, so that really came through of your interests and the importance of process and, and workflows in general. I also enjoyed the origin story of Nucleus, that it was a problem that you were trying to solve and like, hey, maybe we could actually go make a business out of this. So that was great to hear and, and listen to. But the tip that I really want folks to focus on is the one that you opened us up with, which is vulnerability management is not vulnerability scanning. It's not the same thing. And folks need to remember that, that there's a lot more to vulnerability management than just scanning. So thank you for that tip. And in general, thank you for joining us today and, and having a discussion. It was wonderful chatting with you. Thank you. And I will echo that as well, as we have said on the show before, vulnerability scanning, that's the easy part. Finding your problems is easy. Dealing with them, a much, much different story. All right, Scott, any last words and any plug for Nucleus Security? If you have any offers for audience, let us know. Oh, I do. My marketing team would kill me if I didn't at least say something about what we have on offer. So uh, we do have a, a demo on demand that you can sign up for. Obviously, no charge associated with that. We also do free trials. But basically, as, as Mike said, we're very much on the aggregation and workflow management side of the house. And it's a little bit of a different approach to the way that vul traditional vulnerability management has, has been thought about. So uh, if you're interested in that, I know you guys talk about it a lot, but if anybody out there is interested in learning more, definitely feel free to check us out. We're on, I guess we're on Twitter and LinkedIn. I think you're at Nucleus Sec on Twitter, I believe. Yes. Yeah, you can come check out our, our company mascot, the Nucleus Ninja. We have a lot of fun <laughs> with that. Actually, we're planning on giving away potentially a uh, Nucleus branded katana in, you know, good theme at some point in the future. So if you're interested in all, any of that, feel free to come check us out. But yes, as Mike said, just don't forget about your process. That's the one thing that I'll, I'll leave you with. Awesome. Thank you so much, Scott. And thank you, audience. As always, we greatly appreciate your contributions and also listening and telling all your friends about the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. That wraps up another episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do. If you're already a subscriber, write a review. This show thrives on your input. Head over to CISOseries.com and you'll see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at David at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast.